there are other viscous effects, um, not necessarily related to the pore fluid, the presence of the pore fluid. And two common examples are creep and stress relaxation. So creep is the scenario where I apply a load to a material, and I'm I, at some point, when I say load, I'm talking force, right? So I apply a load to the material in my load frame, and I hold it at a constant force. Right? So I don't, I don't change the force, yet over time, even though I'm not changing the force, I'm not increasing or decreasing the force, over time the material continues to strain. This is the process of creep. Okay. Stress relaxation is the process of now I'm not I'm not using a force control. I'm not I'm not going to control the force, but rather just the displacement, right? So I'm going to use you know usually when we use our load frames, frames we use them in displacement control. So I'm going to I'm going to squeeze my sample to a certain <coughs> fixed displacement. And I'm going to hold that displacement fixed, meanwhile monitoring the force in some way. And over time, then that force would decrease due to this process of stress relaxation. And so those are um, those are two other viscous effects. So here's an example in the process of, of creep. This is some real data. So what you see here on this, this line is the confining pressure. So in this case, the, the pressure is ramped up and then held constant for so, for so long. And during that constant period, the strain is monitored and the strain begin, continues to increase. And this happens if there's an unload-reload cycle, uh, but this happens consistently for all, for all time there. That's on a, uh, on a dried sand. So that's an example of creep. Um, you know, a simple constitutive model for creep would be that the strain is a function of time to some initial strain plus CT to the nth power, where C, where C and N are fitting coefficients, right? So this is like what's called a power law model. And does anybody know what sort of the shape of this curve would be, typically? Um, so here we're talking about uh, strain versus time. Then this, this will have some shape like that. Right? So the power law is always going to have that sort of parabolic type shape. And going back to the previous figure, that's sort of what you see, right? So that this is this is a, a model, right? This is a mathematical model. Um, but uh, going back to this, that's kind of what you see here. So you could you could probably you know, fitting a value of C and T be able to match this very well with that power law model. By the way, if it's not clear, the strain is plotted on this axis. This is the confining pressure is the solid lines. Plotted on this axis, the strain is plotted on that axis. So this is time. And in this case, the material I means sand. You just it's sand that's confined, so you never really fail it. It's sand, right? You're just continuing to crush it, crush it, crush it, right? crush out the porosity. Uh, we haven't really talked about failure yet. We're gonna that's what we'll talk about next week. In fact, the whole point of <laughs> the whole point of all of this discussion of constitutional modeling is ultimately to talk about failure because it's failure that we care about in applications, whether it be, uh, you know, the primary application is wellbore stability, but also hydraulic fracture. We, in those cases, we want to understand how the rock material is going to fail under certain loading regimes so that we can determine what we need to do to increase the stability of the wellbore or to make the material, you know, what pressures we need to hydraulically fracture the rock. Um, 
So here's some real, real data on stress relaxation. This actually shows a little more information than just stress relaxation. So this is um, differential stress. Differential stress is like a measure of shear stress, we'll see. So that it's the difference between the greatest and the smallest. Uh, the difference between the, the greatest and the smallest principal stresses. And we'll see why, real soon, why that's a measure of shear stress. But this is like shear stress versus axial strain for different confining pressures. And one thing you notice right away is that if the confining pressure is 15 MPa versus 50 MPa, the material behaves very differently. Right? So this is... Uh, this is fairly consistent for rocks, and this is why it's quite silly that, you know, in the literature on, in most mechanics literature on dealing with the mechanics and petroleum engineering, everything is linear elastic, because in the earth, you have a confining pressure, right? Tectonic stresses are confining the rock, and if you're not, if the material response itself is a function of that confining pressure, obviously, these are this is real data, and all rocks exhibit this behavior. It's not just one straight line parameterized by Young's module. Right? Obviously, those are not straight lines, and they're, parameter and they're parameterized by much more than just one quantity because you, they're a function of the pressure that you're putting on them. So that's the first observation of this guy, without even talking about stress relaxation yet. It's just at different confining pressures, rocks behave differently. Right? In addition to that, there's strain rate behavior. Right? So the three lines here represent three different strain rates at that confining pressure and three different strain rates at that confining pressure. These are pretty low strain rates, 10 to the minus 7. These are the strain rates that we use in the laboratory. So you guys have done unconfined compression strengths. You know the tests take a long time. Right? You're loading that thing very, very, very slowly. So the, in the lab, did you guys, did you actually compute the strain rate? You know the displacement rate of the, that you set, you divide by the length of the original sample, and that gives you roughly the strain rate. So, uh, the engineering strain rate. So you see also not only is the material pressure dependent, but it's strain rate dependent. And a good rule of thumb, it's not always true, but a good rule of thumb is that the material will increase in strength um, about, about five percent per decade of strain rate. Right? So decade of strain rate is 10 to the 7, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 4. When I used to do when I used to do impact problems when I worked at Sandia on geomaterials, you're talking 10 to the third. You're talking eight orders of magnitude higher than that. And the strain rates in impact problems. Right? Car crash type thing. And it, and that and so the material could be, could be apparently three times as strong in some cases, just because you're loading it faster. Um, common analogy I use, anybody ever water skied? Water skied? All right, so, or any kind of water sports behind a boat or something, you know. But, you know, if you just jump off in the dock into the water, it doesn't hurt, right? Uh, but if you're skiing 25 miles an hour by, behind a boat and you mess up and slap the water, it hurts. So the water is apparently stronger. This is, this is water. It's the same molecules, but it's apparently stronger. Okay, that's that's in analogy with this mechanism. The, the actual physical mechanism is different. In water, it has to do with surface tension. Okay. In solid materials, it's it's a different mechanism that causes this rate behavior. But the analogy is the same. Most materials will get stronger the faster you hit them, the faster you load. So there is a there's not only a pressure dependence, but there's a rate dependence. Um, and then, so I haven't even talked about the stress relaxation, which is the point of this plot, and that is to say that so, so over up until this point, the material is strained uh, to like 6.5% strain, and then it's held fixed. And this is time beyond that. And you see that you know, the stress decays, relaxes, as time goes on. So it, you know, it takes a lot of complexity to model real material behavior when you include the effects of creep, stress relaxation, rate dependence, pressure dependence, 
nonlinearity of the stress strain curve. No, no, no. It's I mean, once it's already fractured, then you kind of start over again. It's it's the actual loading loading process. Yeah. Yeah. It's this is not a uh, the, the the visco nature and the, the rate dependence nature due to strain rate is is not um, a permanent thing in the sense that if you like we've talked about a little bit, and we're going to talk more, but we're talking about inelasticity where you, you can have permanent changes in the material. That if you unload them completely and then you reload them, they'll, they'll preserve those permanent deformations, perm permanent strains, whatnot. In this case, this rate effect is, it, it is, uh, it's not a permanent thing. So if you, if you unloaded it and you did it again, you'd, you'd expect to get the same response. Or in your sort of rubbleized example, if you had a solid material, you loaded it at a high strain rate to failure, and then say you were able to take those small pieces of that you f a failed material and go and test them. If everything is done carefully, you know, you know, taking out any observation error, or experimental error, then you should get the same response. That that rubbleized material uh, is unlikely to have any permanent changes due to the fact, just due to, the, just due to the nature of the rate dependence. Now, there could be other mechanisms that cause it to permanently change, but not the rate dependence. Okay. So 